Taiwan is an island, so obviously surrounded by ocean. And in a lot of the stories of old Taiwan that, that we've told, the sea has, I guess, a starring role. You know, we had the ports, trade, naval battles, bombings of the ports, blockades of the ports, and uh, an awful lot of shipwrecks. But it wasn't only in the old days when Taiwan had dramatic maritime tales to tell. And we want to look at some of the more modern stories of the sea today. The Taiwan History Podcast, Formosa Files, is made possible through the generous sponsorship of the Frank C. Chen Foundation. Formosa Files. Yep, uh, the sea can be a cruel mistress. Mm. And even today, she extracts a heavy toll. Eric, you're familiar with the so-called Bermuda Triangle. What does that name bring to mind? The Bermuda Triangle, uh, an area of supposed mysterious disappearances of airplanes and especially ships somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean uh, with the triangle from like Miami and Florida to the island of Bermuda. But what was the third point? Uh, it's rather loosely defined, but sometimes uh, that third one is Puerto Rico. But the problem is it's absolute, complete n nonsense. Yeah. A quick look at the records of missing ships and planes for that area do not show anything unusual. The numbers of disappearances is not higher than elsewhere. And tons of the details of the cases just don't hold up. They're either fabricated or the evidence of the case is just ignored. I would have to say if the Bermuda Triangle makes for compelling fiction, but there's nothing there. That's it. Fiction. One of the, the most important figures for popularizing the idea of the Bermuda Triangle was Charles Berlitz, author of a book, The Bermuda Triangle, published in 1974. Berlitz was interested in paranormal phenomena, the lost continent of Atlantis, UFOs. Right. And uh, he even linked those to the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. Yeah. Although Berlitz helped make the Bermuda Triangle a household name, he didn't have so much luck with another book published in 1989 called The Dragon's Triangle. The Dragon's Triangle. And the area is also sometimes called, but by very few people, uh, the Devil's Triangle, the Devil's Sea, and the Formosa Triangle. That's not really cool to be mixed up with the Formosa Dragon Devil. But anyway, what area does this uh, supposed triangle cover? An area of the North Pacific extending from Japan, uh, from east of Tokyo, all the way down to Micronesia, the <laughs> islands of Guam and Yap. But the geographical limits are very vague. <laughs> That's a, a pretty massive area. Uh, so you said Formosa Triangle. So obviously that would indicate Taiwan is one of the points. Yes. But let's wrote that Taiwan was the westernmost point of the Dragon's Triangle. And within this vaguely defined triangle, he claimed ships went missing in spooky ways. He suggested various possible explanations, uh, magnetic anomalies, underwater volcanic activity. Ah, 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 and let me guess, extraterrestrial craft. Yeah, uh, <laughs> UFO sightings were noted, uh, uh -huh. and there were some uh, there, there was some exotic Asian flavor uh, mm. thrown in. Uh, ancient Oriental legends tell off, blah blah. Mm, uh, actually, they don't. There are no legends that I know of of sea dragons dragging ships to watery graves. Mm. Well, he wrote the strange and mysterious incidents within the Dragon Triangle have been well known in Japan and other nearby islands for a much longer time than the occurrences in the Bermuda Triangle. Ooh. Ships have been recorded as disappearing in the Dragon's Triangle for more than a thousand years. Some researchers say 3,000 years. <laughs> Japanese and Chinese language sources only mention the triangle after Berlitz's 1989 book. That's funny. A bit like uh, Chinese uh, fortune cookies, right? Those are actually an American invention. Yeah. So if the Bermuda Triangle is an example of uh, successful modern mythmaking, then uh, the Dragon's Triangle is a good example of a failure. It has never caught on. No. And what was his evidence for disappearing ships? Very poor evidence, 
nothing. A uh, <laughs> mysterious colour added to simple cases of ships encountering bad weather or faulty seamanship. And also moving sinkings from outside the area to within the triangle. Okay, so a ship would sink somewhere else and then he'd like just move it into a different area and attribute it to the powers of the Formosa Triangle. Yeah. Uh, in his book, Charles Berlitz has a, a list which he titles A Roll Call of Disappearances. And it's very unimpressive. The majority of listings are for ships lost outside of the Dragon Triangle, as is the case with the two for Taiwan, not actually in the deep Pacific. So not in this so-called triangle area at all. Correct. And details of the book are wrong. For example, a Japanese cargo ship called the Sea Pine, according to the book, it was a victim of the triangle, 26 men vanishing in 1971 en route from Japan to Taiwan, when in fact it disappeared in October of 78, sailing from eastern Borneo for the port of Taichung with a cargo of logs. It went missing in a storm, last reported about 190 kilometers southwest of Taiwan, or 23 crew on board were lost. Okay. So basically every single thing in that is wrong. Wrong year, wrong locations, wrong fatality count. And there's an extremely obvious possible explanation. A storm? Mm-hmm. Well, he got the name right. The okay. Pine. So the Dragon's Triangle might be, or I think is, complete fiction, But, you know, there's really no need to invent such a phenomenon. There have been and continue to be disappearances aplenty in this region. Yes. For example, a ship called Hualien No. 1 vanished on February 28th in the year 2000. It was transporting gravel from Hualien to Danshui. I remember that. Those were really dramatic times. It was a couple weeks before the historic 2000 presidential election. Yes. So uh, a couple of weeks before the uh, election, the, the missing ship Hualien No. 1 set sail from Hualien at 5.30 p.m. and was scheduled to arrive in Danshui at 7 a.m the next day. But of course, the ship and crew members never arrived and a no distress call was received. This is what the weird thing about this one. No wreckage, no oil spill, no floating debris. Nothing was found. It went missing without a trace. And back then there was actually speculation that the ship might have been hijacked and taken to China. But, you know, that's pretty unlikely. A mystery, but not especially mysterious No need to come up with uh, wild theories when there's a simpler explanation. The weather was bad. Right. Very strong winds, uh, gale force gusts. It was reported that two other vessels at Hualien actually delayed their voyages at that time because they thought the weather was just too dangerous. Mm -hmm. When the ship failed to arrive at its scheduled time, the search began uh, with the early search efforts focusing on the area around Guishan, uh, Turtle Island, a landmark off the coast of Ilan County. And that was a bit of a pity because it's possible that if they had searched Elsewhere, maybe they would have found someone or something. Yeah. Based on records from uh, Zhonghua Telecom, a crew member's phone had been exchanging signals with uh, Zhonghua Telecom's coastal transceiver stations with the last signal indicating that the vessel was not that far from Danshui. So it most likely vanished around the northern tip of Taiwan. Yes. And despite all the incredible communication and navigation technology that we have Even now, the oceans and seas remain dangerous to sail on. In 2015, there was that disappearance of a Taiwanese fishing vessel. It was called the Xiang Fu Chun, I think, carrying a large crew Mm -hmm. of 49, and it vanished in the remote South Atlantic Ocean. There was no May Day, uh, no May Day call, but there had been a call previously that there was leaking on the deck. Um, But yeah, the ship lost contact with its owners. Um, soon after that uh, message. Yeah. So should we assume again that this is bad weather? Not sure of the weather, but it's a region of high winds and big waves. So much open space in the Southern Hemisphere. It's much windier than the uh, Northern equivalent latitude. I've been there and it's hellishly windy. Okay, the South Atlantic Ocean, hellish. But it is an old fishing ground for Taiwanese vessels. They're out there looking for squid. These are squid boats, mostly for the domestic market. So putting aside the mystery angle, that case of the missing squid boat, it highlights the international reach of Taiwan's fishing fleets. 
Yes, and its crew of 49, which consisted of a Taiwanese captain and chief engineer, 11 Chinese, 21 Indonesians, 13 Filipinos, and two Vietnamese sailors, uh, that shows the reliance on foreign crews, most commonly from Indonesia. So just two Taiwanese among a crew of 49 and then multiple other nationalities. That's, I don't know, perhaps a recipe for misunderstandings, uh, disputes. Mm -hmm. The gravel transport and the fishing boat are good examples of the ship and crew disappearing together. But there's that other kind of disappearance that's much freakier, the so-called ghost ships. You know, when you find an empty ship drifting on the seas, no crew aboard, and no indication of what might have happened to them. There was such an incidence in early 2021. A ghost ship, the Taiwanese fishing boat Yong Yuxing, number 18, which was found drifting in waters near Hawaii. It was first spotted by a U.S. search and rescue plane. And then fishermen from other uh, nearby Taiwanese fishing boats boarded the vessel and they found no one on the ship. Mm. All 10 crew members, a Taiwanese captain and nine Indonesian sailors, gone. The boat was towed back to its home port of Suau in northeast Taiwan. And uh, an investigation of several months concluded that there was no suspicion of criminal activity, leaving bad weather conditions as the most likely explanation. Yeah, it's it's an explanation, bad weather, but it's still kind of puzzling, right? When you mm. have every single member gone. So like what happened? A freak wave took everyone off the deck with nobody below, nobody's at the controls. It, it's weird. What other possible explanations could there be? Um, did they run out of food and did they abandon the vessel? Maybe they were abducted. Uh, you don't want to speak ill of the dead, right? Or presumed dead. Mm. But uh, maybe mutiny? Yeah, um, there are a couple of uh, mutiny stories. We can look at that and look at those in a future episode. Okay. So, John, what's the most unexpected ocean Taiwan related story that you've ever come across? The disappearance of a dashing Frenchman called Baron Arnold de Rosny. Uh, so Baron's not his first name. He's an aristocrat. An aristocrat. And more, a Vogue photographer, jet-setting the world, photographing models and celebrities. He was from an interesting and accomplished family and a wealthy one. So Baron de Rosny uh, helped to introduce windsurfing to France. A man of diverse interests, he uh, invented a board game called Petropolis. Basically a board game like Monopoly, but players went around the world buying up oil states and oil reserves. <laughs> a board game based on buying petroleum. Okay, so it was the 1970s, right? All those oil shocks mm. and all that. But um, I don't think that uh, game would have caught on in any case. <laughs> More impressively, uh, he invented a new adventure sport. So, Eric, uh, have you ever heard of Terra Sailing? Okay, so Terra, uh, Terra Firma, Terra Incognito. Terra means land, right? So... Yep. Terra land windsurfing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A mix uh, between skateboarding and windsurfing? Yeah, like a big skateboard with a, a sail on it. Yeah. Okay. So he, yeah, he invented that. In 1979, the Baron Terra sailed for more than a thousand kilometers in North Africa. Yeah, mm. Sounds cool. So what was this Baron's connection with uh, Taiwan? Or it was the Taiwan Strait, yeah? He disappeared on a solo trip across the Taiwan Strait in November of 1984. The odd twist here is, apart from who he was, the means of transport. He was on a windsurfing board. He was trying to windsurf from China to Taiwan. Uh, that's across the 100-mile Taiwan Strait. Okay. Um, first of all, this is illegal today. So I'm assuming in 1984, it was even more illegal. But why would he want to do that? It was part of a series of trips uh, crossing politically contentious waters, oh. as well as an adventure. Um, there was a symbolic bridging of two countries separated by politics or, or distance. Uh, so he'd already completed more challenging crossings, uh, including windsurfing from Florida to Cuba and crossing from Japan to Siberia. Anyway, on Saturday, November 24th, de Rosny set sail from Chuanzhou in Fujian, China, 
hoping to avoid Chinese warships, he didn't have any permission, and reach central Taiwan in, he estimated, about eight hours. So what other details do we know? Not a lot, I'm afraid. He was breaking the law with his trips and uh, looking for help and getting uh, around the rules. Uh, so this is not something you'd advertise. Um but he'd, he'd mentioned the trip in a television interview in England that summer uh, where he was competing in a windsurfing contest. Interestingly, he said that he would windsurf from Taiwan to China. Uh, he couldn't get authorization from either country. Yeah. So I've read that he laid low in China for 10 days before sneaking away into the, the sea. He doesn't show up in Taiwan and people get worried, right? Worried, but not too alarmed yet. He's been in trouble at sea before and survived uh, on an 800 kilometer trip in French Polynesia. Uh, he was days late, uh, but he eventually turned up. Okay, But yeah, as time goes by, the alarm bells do go off. Uh, air and sea searches ensue, uh, land searches along the coast of Taiwan, but nothing turns up. I've read searches went on for 11 days, uh, but they didn't find a board, a sail, nothing. Okay, so how was the weather at this point in time? Typically windy, uh, but he was used to windsurfing in such conditions. But then again, you only need to make one mistake, right? Yeah, seriously. I'm sure there would have been speculation that he had been shot by the Chinese Navy or the Taiwanese Navy, or perhaps captured by pirates, uh, I can imagine. But the simplest possibility is by far the most likely, of course, right? He fell off his board mm. and got separated from it. And unfortunately, that was the end of that. That was the conclusion reached by his brother, Joel DeRosny, himself a superb surfer and windsurfer. He said, my opinion is quite simple. He just fell from the board. That's a strange story, an odd mission, but the disappearance part is not all that mysterious because the Taiwan Strait is a really rough body of water in winter months. Uh, like, for example, nobody visits Penghu virtually between November and March, except me. I've done that twice. It's, ex yeah, it's so windy. You can't even keep your motorcycle upright sometimes. People build these walls made out of coral to stop the winds. It is incredibly windy between November and March. I've been there uh, in uh, kinder months. And yeah, the locals, when they tell you it's really windy, they follow that up with really windy. We're not exaggerating. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not. But, you know, boats are dangerous. Water's dangerous. You don't need a, a devil's triangle. You don't need wild oceans or a wind-lashed strait. I'm reminded of my native country of New Zealand. Drowning in New Zealand used to be so common. It was known as the New Zealand disease. Hmm. And, you know, going around old cemeteries and you're reading the gravestones, uh, sometimes they give the cause of death and uh, drowning predominates, crossing rivers, traveling in lakes, uh, seas, and we have a wild strait as well. So like Taiwan, New Zealand's mountainous, rainy, and uh, has unforgiving coastal areas. That strikes me as weird because you guys are good swimmers and sailors. Yes, although that can lead to um, overconfidence. The Taiwan approach is a more fearful one, uh, just trying to avoid water. <laughs> it's true. If you visit uh, beach areas like south of where I am down in Kending, you see people snorkeling in like shoulder deep water with life jackets on. And if you go out too far, which is again about shoulder depth, uh, the lifeguards blow their whistles and you got to come back in. In general, it's fair to say that uh, Taiwanese people are not all that happy with being being in water. One explanation I heard was that uh, there's not a lot of swimming pools or there weren't a lot of swimming pools. Like in America, you have many people have them in their backyard or, you know, it's, it's easy. So yeah. they didn't have that. But but there's also cultural reasons. And one of those is ghost month. And during ghost month, people get extremely nervous about water. Yeah. For non-Taiwan residents, uh, ghost month, that's the seventh lunar month of the Chinese calendar, typically it falls in August, and it's a time when the dead roam the world of the living. Yeah, there's so many little taboos and stuff that you can't do during ghost month. For example, you can't call them ghosts. You got to call them good brothers. You get, you, know, you get offerings of food. They burn ghost money. There's still many people here that take the month pretty seriously. You know, they don't buy an apartment or a car or, you know, skip out on scheduling a wedding during that month. And you'll hear, you know, a grandparent warn against going swimming because of water ghosts. 
and one explanation begets the need for another, water ghosts. Okay, these are murderous spirits, not just dangerous during ghost month. The idea is that people who drown become a water ghost, and the water ghost waits in bondage until a victim can be pulled in to take its place. That is that is suitably spooky. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so moving on to our next historical event, Unfortunately, we're going to be discussing a modern tragedy that occurred in an unlikely location quite a ways away from the sea. We're talking about Sun Moon Lake, the largest lake in Taiwan. So we have these other places like Chenching Lake, but those are not real lakes. Those are reservoirs. Sun Mm. Moon Lake is a real lake. It's the largest lake in Taiwan. It's a gorgeous scenic resort in Nanto County, central Taiwan. But in 1990, an overcrowded pleasure boat on a moon gazing cruise capsized. And that accident claimed 57 lives. It was a weekend trip for Shell Oil Company uh, employees. Uh, Shell Oil Company, well, its local division, Shell Taiwan. Uh, a two-day, one-night trip to Nanto, company employees and family members. So quite late in the evening, they went for a cruise. Uh, not a regular cruise trip, but uh, exclusively uh, for this Shell group. The accident happened on August 25th. That was a Saturday. And it was the eve of Qixi, the seventh day of the seventh lunar month on the Chinese calendar. And that's an ancient festival celebrating the annual meeting of the cowherd and the weaver girl. This is a romantic fairy tale, and Qixi is sometimes referred to as Chinese Valentine's Day. But if you note, the seventh month is also ghost month. At about 9.20 9.20 in the evening, the boat looked to turn and head back to the pier. According to reports, what had previously been a calm night suddenly saw a strong north wind. The boat, the Xingye, was overloaded, almost double the legal limit, and with so many of the people on the upper decks, the cruise boat had a dangerously high center of gravity, and the boat's turning left, a hard left. There was a sudden gust of wind from the north, and then the boat tilted and instantly overturned left to right. Some of the passengers drowned after getting crushed or held under the overturned boat, and others drowned from not being able to swim, and also there was a lack of safety equipment. Only a few managed to get life jackets. Several of the tourists who knew how to swim immediately swam to the shore, which was about 500 meters away. And when all the bodies were recovered, the fatalities were a total of 57 people, 55 shell employees and family members, two tour guides, and 18 of the dead, very sadly, were children. There were 35 survivors, most of which were rescued by another boat. Police arrested the pilot and vessel's owner, surnamed Shu and uh, charged him with involuntary manslaughter. Shu blamed the accident on strong winds, but he had a lot to answer for. The motor launch was unlicensed. It was badly overloaded. Uh, It was in in breach of a 6 p.m. curfew for boat trips on the lake, Uh, and there was a lack of life jackets, and uh, he seems to have been the only uh, crew member on the boat. Uh, And the the boat actually has a, a, a pretty spooky end itself, In 2007, a group of teenagers set fire to the the boat, and that was the final footnote to that terrible tragedy. But, you know, there is a silver lining, if I can put it that way. At least the Sun Moon Lake drownings of uh, that year led to a whole bunch of new rules and actually enforcement of the rules. There were bans on unlicensed boats. Uh, Safety equipment was, you know, you, you mandated. They cracked down on overloading and all of that. Safety did improve. And since then, there's been no repeat of such a horrific tragedy. And the the beautiful lake attracts millions of visitors every year and enjoys, since then, a very, very safe record. So, uh, yeah, sometimes we have to learn things the hard way. So, John, um, any last thoughts? Well, yes, uh, just that... Although Taiwan is an island, it's a pity that people have such a poor relationship with the the nearby seas, with Mm. the coast. Um, I'd love them to explore it more, to learn how to do it safely, of course. But for many decades, areas of the coast were off limits. That's right. Restricted areas. And uh, you couldn't own a boat, well, other than fishermen. So you couldn't have your personal watercraft. So there are reasons for 
people not uh, taking to the coastal waters as much as you would expect. Yes, and that is uh, changing, right? We, we see a lot more uh, smaller pleasure boats. We see people out there with paddle boards and stuff. So yeah, starting to change. Starting to change, yes. All right, thanks for joining us. I'm Eric Michael Smith. I'm John Ross. Catch you next time. Bye.